My mother had me, gave birth to me, when she was 18 years old, which means I was born in a shack in Hertzville, Alabama. There were these generations in that little shack that had no plumbing, no electricity. My parents, my father's parents, my parents and I lived in that little place. We were poor, dirt poor. I know what dirt poor means. Some people use that word and they have no understanding. Dirt poor is just that dirt. That was the floor. When I was born, my mother said to my father and to his parents, George is the baby that's going to take us out of poverty. Now, that was a bold statement for a poor black woman. But you know, I think all poor mothers say that about their babies when they're born. Well, I was that child. I was that baby. I was the one who, thanks to my mother and some teachers, uh, managed to be the first generation in my family uh, to graduate from high school, college, and on and on and on, always the first. My mother gave me her dream, and she gave my father and his parents the hope that someday, just maybe if we would hold on just a little longer and let this baby get an education, then he can bring in a gener the next generations out of poverty. I did that with her help and with the help of, let me just set the record straight for black history, if I, if I may. Sometimes we talk about black and white as if they're separate. All of my elementary and secondary school years and four years of college and one year of graduate school, all of my teachers were white. The good, the bad, and the ugly were white. So don't tell me that only black people can teach black people or brown people. Brown. Don't do that. Not, not, not with me, not in black history or any other history. People help people. You ask about me. I grew up hating, actually hating people from other cultural groups, especially white people. My father was run out of Alabama by the Ku Klux Klan. Two of my relatives were lynched. My father never told me the other part of that story, how we got out of Alabama. My father was a black mason. A white mason extended a courtesy to a black mason and said, you better get out of here. Because of that fight that you had with that white man, we're coming here later to lynch you. That was no idle threat in the South. So we left Alabama with two suitcases, some paper sacks, and everything else, and we moved from the poverty of the South to poverty of the North, from racism of the South to racism of the North. Not much changed, only the location. That's my history. I want to tell you about two teachers in terms of history. If you want to know about the history of George, you have to tell the history of two white teachers, one in particular. I remember... I was about a high D average student. I was in special education when I, when I was in the first three or four grades. And I remember this teacher. She said, George, sometimes you do well and other times you do poorly. Why don't you at least try to be a, a consistent student? And I looked at this very middle-aged white woman and she's prodding me to do better. And I said in my most arrogant, youthful way, why should I do better? I'm poor, I'm black, and I live in a segregated community. I sleep with rats and roaches and bed bugs. I seldom have a full meal. We were on and off welfare. And the history of George Henderson starts in terms of my reclamation with those, with, with my one teacher in particular. She says, it's true, you're black. I can't do anything about that. It's true you're poor, I can't do anything about that either. And it's true you live in a segregated neighborhood, I can't do anything about that, but you may if you get a good education. Black history for George Henderson started with a white teacher telling me of the promise of me. You ask about my youth, my youth was a period of hating people, hating myself. I went through a period in which I detested my thick lips. 
I didn't like my kinky hair. My skin was too dark. I smell because we didn't have deodorant and we didn't have running water. We didn't have a lot of things and I, but I had love. I had acceptance from a mother who believed in me before I believed in myself. And then along came this white teacher who believed in me too. So the history of George Henderson is the history of people, one black in particular and one white in particular who said you represent what the United States should stand for, an opportunity to do whatever you want to do if you have the skills and the abilities and to do it well. Mine was a childhood of first finding myself and loving myself. My mother loved me every single day. She said, told me those words. My mother loved me as her mother loved her warmly. My father loved me as his father loved him harshly. My father beat me. My father beat me because he wanted to make a man of me because I, as a black man, I wouldn't have to fight. I think my father told me I love you maybe four times in my life, but I knew he loved me. My mother would hug me and squeeze me. Sometimes I think I would lose my breath. That was George Henderson's life. So you ask about my childhood. My childhood was moving from poverty to getting an education, from illiteracy to literacy, from poverty to affluence, from hate to love. It was a long journey. It was a, it was a bitter, torturous journey. But along the way I met, oh gosh, I was fortunate for a lot of reasons. I'll skip the middle, the beginning part, and I'll say when I, I graduated from high school from the National Honor Society, high school of 260, this black kid who was destined to be nobody was one of 26 National Honor students, one of four black. Four of us went to college. No other black kids in, our, in my senior class went to college. My history, my history is doing what people say that you couldn't do, shouldn't do because you're poor, you're black, and well. In my 50 plus years at OU, came in 1967, race relations throughout the years have been echoes of previous generations. The times changed, the events changed, and progress changed somewhat. Almost every generation, new generation in 10 year periods would say that, you know, this is, a, nothing's changed around here. Wrong. <laughs> the mere fact that I'm here giving this interview meant that the University of Oklahoma changed, being the third flat African American professor. I guess what I'm saying when I see racism and when I see bigotry, let's, let's call it bigotry. When I see bigotry, I saw bigotry when I came to this place. Our family history, we were the first black stone property in Norman. I, didn't, I was naive. But you know, all of my life, I lived in black neighborhoods before I came to the University of Oklahoma. And I'm teaching in Detroit while I'm working on a master's and a doctorate. I'm an adjunct instructor. And during a, one period in my life, I helped three white students in, in, in the class that I was teaching as an adjunct instructor. They became freedom riders. They did something that I didn't do. And they listened to me and they got up enough courage and they went and they did something about it. I remember some of my students integrating their neighborhoods. I never did. History has a strange way of coming back at you and letting you look in the mirror and then saying, for a period of time, you really were an imposter, George Henderson. I was. I taught people to accept one another I taught people to love one another. I taught people to do a lot of things together, but I did not practice those things. Martin Luther King Jr. again, a mentor. He said in one of his meetings, I don't know where I got this, but I've heard it and I tell it and, and, and I believe it. And he said this, when I think about race relations and I think about the University of Oklahoma, we ain't what we want to be. We ain't what we ought to be. 
we ain't what we're going to be. But thank God we ain't what we was. That's the history of us. We're not what we want to be as a nation if we're committed to a democracy and humaneness. But we're not those people who were just almost mostly cruel individuals. They were still there and they're still there. But the point is this. If you look at the photos of the civil rights movement during the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, there were a few white allies, but we were mostly black and brown people. Fast forward, 2021, 2020, 2021. Look at those photos. There is an awful lot of white in there. Progress? Doggone right, there's progress. We now have a critical mass for the very first time of allies who understand that none of us is free until all of us are free. And that has nothing to do with color. It has everything to do with believing. I think about the University of Oklahoma. When I came, this was two universities in one, one black, one white. Oh, gosh, the things in the 60s and 70s that people were complaining about, the rebel flag, having uh, celebrations of Plantation Day and people in blackface and simulating picking cotton and eating chicken and all of those things were occurring on our campus and the racial slurs, it all happened. Fast forward to the 20th century, it was still happening, but not to, to the extent that it is now. If two or three incidents occurred on our campus in the 1960s and 70s, we would have said we were in heaven. They were daily slurs. There were daily fights. There was a hostility daily. In fact, the civil rights movement in historically black colleges and universities in Oklahoma started at this university in the late 1960s where black students, members of the Afro-American Student Union and their allies, white allies, the Student Action Committee, challenged racism on this campus. Who says nothing has changed? Lord, there were three of us that black professors in those days, one Native American, and I don't know about the Latinx. Today, we have more. You say, but we have more faculty. But yes, we do, but proportionately, we have more. When I look at this university and I see Oh, gosh, I see the beauty of the campus. I, I, I see the promise of the campus. And each generation is subsequently different than the previous generation. Black history? Black history is celebrating where we have come from. We tend to distort it by celebrating a few heroes. Truth be told, and I will tell this is my truth, I knew Malcolm, I knew Martin, I knew Cesar Chavez. And I could go on and on and on. They got the headlines. The hard work was made by folks like me and you and all of the other people. We had to do the hard work in the communities. Black history is American history, and it should be celebrated by all of us. Because we sang in the Civil Rights Movement, we shall overcome. It, we didn't sing blacks shall overcome or Latinos shall overcome or Indians or anything. We said we. Black history is realizing that we are still singing that song and we're still doing the work. There are more non-blacks doing the work today than ever before. Yes, we were a university that was close to a civil war, black versus white. There would, there would be fights, fist fights, in bars and on, and on campus corner. And it was, it was like the Wild West. But always there was this voice. There was the voice of who led us out of the civil rights, in the civil rights people on this campus, students. The professors and the staff and the, and, and the others were, many of them for what, for rightful reasons, were afraid for their jobs. Well, I wasn't afraid for a job. I, I, I grew up poor, so I could live poor. I'm never afraid. I never had a job I was afraid to lose. But I didn't want to lose my dignity. And the students didn't want to lose their dignity. And they gave dignity and respect to one another together. You talk about the past. I'm that old man who closes his eyes and I dream. And in my dreams, I see white students being denounced by their parents and threatened to have their inheritance cut off because they were doing this race stuff. 
I see the hippies and I see the others who just want to love and care for one another. And I hear the sounds of cars that would drive through uh, Lindsay Street and Boyd Street and watch and, shell and scream out racial slurs. And I see the bar fights. And I see the students, always a few students, every generation saying, that's not us. We're better than this. History for me, I've lived my life in stages. I think we all do. There was a stage in which we indeed had to fight segregation, abject segregation and discrimination. We did. And gradually moved to the point where we are now that, you know, big as a morph like uh, some kind of uh, Star Trek uh, creature. They change from where what you think you see isn't what's really happening. Whereas before, in the old days, I like the old days because people didn't like it. They said it to your face and said, I don't like you, and they call you the slur. You knew your enemies. We moved to the 21st century. We're not sure who our friends are. They say the right words. They even use fancy terms, and they apologize for their whiteness or, their, or whatever. But in the old days, if somebody didn't like you, they, they didn't like you. And they were upfront about it. It's more difficult today. Lots of people say the right words to get the right grade or to get the job. I found it easier being confronting people who were honest about their feelings. I found it a challenge, and the other students also. And incidentally, let me for the, set the record straight in terms of our black history. Black history at OU was a combination of black and white and brown and Native American students joining together to celebrate our common humanity. We did that. And doing that kept George Henderson here because there was always one more battle to fight, one more war to try to win. We didn't win any wars, but we won a few battles and we lost a few. It was celebrating our gains and mourning our losses and not lording over other people and not being the abusers ourselves. It was learning how to be humane. I stay here and will continue to stay here because we do it better than anywhere else that I know. We have a history in this campus of more student leaders who are from majority and minority groups working together. And we have more minority group leaders than any other university that I know of in the South and the Southwest. Think about that. We are history. We are black history in Oklahoma. I don't think we celebrate enough the sacrifices that the parents or the sisters and the brothers and the cousins made when they said, my, I had students in class who say, my parents and our relatives are racist. And they don't even want you coming to our house, but Dr. Henderson, we're with you. Those were the days in which we drew the line and said, we found common ground, we found each other, and we sang those songs, we shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Nowhere did we sing only white or brown or black or multiracial people shall overcome. It was that inclusive word, we. The difference that I, that I, that I see somewhat is this. There is an awful lot of attention being placed on certain groups and not other groups. We've lost the inclusiveness of the movement. Now, before somebody says, oh, there goes Doc Henderson saying that blacks aren't, I'm not saying aren't important, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying the promise of the United States is that we are one. You ask a question that Psychologically, we repress negative thoughts and we remember positive things. Your question really triggered some neg bad things that happened to me, bad things that happened to my family and my children, but the good things happened on this campus too. Black history is coming into a neighborhood, coming into a community and a university where some people don't want you. And it's the people who want you that make the difference the realtor who sold us a house and, lost their, and they lost their business within three or four years. And one of the owners said, if we had not sold you that house, we would have lost more than our business. 
we have lost our, 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 our beliefs and our dignity. They're their heroes. The black students who indeed were not given the grades that they, were, that they, that they deserved because they were rebel rousers. The white students who were ridiculed by their white friends because they were socializing with those people. It was us together. It was all of us. Black history is about all of us. We sometimes look at the, 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 the heroes, the heroines, and we don't see the mothers and the fathers, the grandparents and, 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 and the relatives and the others who were here and decided they were not going to be onlookers. They were going to be allies and active participants. We found our voices here, and we spoke our truths here. And in the early days of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, some people paid, paid great prices to do that. Black history on this campus is celebrating their heroes and their heroines who sacrificed so that we could be here today saying, more change is going to come. Let's stop for maybe one year and have a Black History Month where we celebrate all of us and what roles all of us played in our histories. I have these dreams. I have these wishes. I have no regrets. I didn't come to the university for money. I came to teach. I didn't come to the University of Oklahoma for honors. I came to teach. And I tell every generation that I've taught, I came for you. I came for you. And they stayed with me. And we became one. That's my history. I knew Martin, I knew Malcolm, and there's the others that I told you. But the bravest, the most courageous people that I have known were the students who made a decision that they would risk their careers, some of them their lives, to go against the hatred that they heard in their homes and their communities to try to change things. They're the heroes. I will never forget them. I will never forget them. Maybe I'm saying something else when I talk about the importance of this university. In many ways, this is the least likely place that one will be expected to find courageous students like those of you who are watching, and parents like those of you who are watching, or your children and others who did it. In one way or another, we found a way to get beyond just race as a concept. We learned to live it to live humane relations. We talk about human relations in the program that I created. It's humane relations. We found a way in the darkest hours of the university's history to huddle together and to hold tight to one another and say, hold on just a little bit longer and this university will change and it has changed and it will continue to change. I stay here. This was my destiny. <laughs> I've been an administrator. I did it well. I created, the, with the, on the College of Liberal Studies, the first BA degree online. The Human Relations Program. I did some great things, but the most wonderful things that I did was help create the, recreate the lives of students. Yeah, history is not about one person. And I would, like to, I would like to think that people like me, professors like me, administrators, staff members, and others who give their time to move the agenda along one person at a time are the most valuable individuals in our history, Black History Month, because it's the unrecognized individuals who are never really adequately recognized so that the George Henderson can get another award in honor. And he didn't come here for that. 
and I hope they didn't come here for that either. So that crazy people like me, a father of seven children and a mother-in-law and a wife, would take a $5,000 pay cut to teach at this place called Oklahoma because of the promise here. No, not true. My creator sent me here. I didn't have a choice. Now, I'm going to share this, and you probably then can say he was certifiably insane and he should have been committed in those days. We can rectify that and catch him now and put him away. It was never about the money. It was always about the students. In my order, in terms of the history makers, the students started it. Faculty and staff went along later. And the students are going to have to finish it. And they are. 2020 and 2021, look at the young faces. It's time for us old men and old women to acknowledge the truth. There is a saying, the children shall lead them. Well, let us let them. Teach them the skills that they need. And our history is preparing the next generation of us. That's something to be proud of. I'm proud of the fact that all seven of my children, Barbara and my cho our children, came to a place where our family wasn't wanted, and all of them found friends here. And all of my children, at one time or another, when they thought that uh, Daddy was going to take a job here, there, and somewhere else, in every job offer, they would all say, Dad, you and Mom can go. We're going to keep the house here. Come visit us. That's history. And history are their friends who they made here. And history are faculty members. Over the years, I've seen and worked with some wonderful faculty and staff persons, the sacrifices that the janitors and the custodians and the groundskeepers and people who work in the food services and the staff and the clerical and the and individuals, the, the, the heart and soul of the university, we should celebrate them. They've supported us and almost always when we celebrate black history or any other history, we celebrate a few of the prominent people and the prominent people are ones who make it possible for us to do what we do. I, I love what I do. I love the students that I've been fortunate enough to teach and to learn with and from. I'm grateful that my creator gave me this one gift. And I'm awfully pleased that my mother made me go to church when I was young. And that wasn't a conversation. She was telling me what I was going to do. My mother made me go to church and I heard these words. God is love. Period. Complete sentence. Not hatred, not indifference, not bigotry, not this, not that. Love. It's inclusive. Dare we live it? I say, dare we not live it? I want to say thank you for the next generation of students. Not for what you've done, but for what you're going to do. I give you that payment in advance so that you know that you owe me. Earn it. I gave it, now you earn it, just as the subsequent generations before you earned it. <laughs>